It is my pleasure to introduce both Dr. Lisa Chu and Dr. John Scott this morning. So starting first with Dr. Chu, she is a UW Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of General Internal Medicine and serves as the Associate Medical Director of Ambulatory Care at Harborview Medical Center. Dr. Chu earned her MD at the University of California, San Francisco, went on to complete her internal medicine training at the University of Washington in the primary care track, followed by an ambulatory chief resident year at Harborview Medical Center and a master's in public health epidemiology at the University of Washington. Dr. Chu's clinical work and research throughout her career has been dedicated to improving healthcare for vulnerable populations. This has included publications and presentations on health literacy, physician prescribing practices, the patient-centered medical home, and most recently, improving e-consults and optimizing referrals. It is this latest work that brings her here to speak with us today. Our second speaker today is Dr. John Scott. Dr. Scott is a UW Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Allergy and Infectious Disease and serves as the Medical Director for Telehealth and the Associate Director for the Hepatitis and Liver Clinic at Harborview Medical Center. Dr. Scott earned his MD at Georgetown University School of Medicine, went on to complete his internal medicine training at Stanford University Medical Center, followed by fellowship training in infectious disease here at the University of Washington, as well as a Master's of Science in Epidemiology at the University of Washington School of Public Health. Dr. Scott's clinical work and research has focused on viral hepatitis and the use of telehealth technologies to improve care of patients. Along with the Public Health Seattle King County, he is working on a CDC-funded initiative to increase diagnosis, linkage to care, and treatment of patients with hepatitis C. In 2009, he launched Project ECHO in Washington State, a telehealth program aimed at helping clinicians serving in rural and underserved areas evaluate and treat hepatitis C, HIV, and tuberculosis. It is this background and research that brings him here to speak with us today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lisa Chu and Dr. John Scott as they present Coordinating an Optimal Referral Experience Through E-Consults and Enhanced Referrals, the UW Medicine Experience. Thank you and um, good morning. We really appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk about the e-consults and enhanced referral program here today. Before we dive into the details of the program, it's important to recognize that at the core of this program, the goal, is, the goal of the program is really to build and strengthen relationships among primary care and specialty care providers and develop a sense of community to better serve our patients. Over the past two and a half years, we've been very fortunate to be able to work alongside faculty, both primary and specialty care providers, and we've been very impressed with their commitment to this program, their collaborative spirit, and their willingness to try something new. So we want to make sure we acknowledge and thank them for their effort. So over the next 45 to 50 minutes, we're going to describe the e-consult and enhanced referral model, otherwise known as the core model, describe our experience to date at the University of Washington, and then discuss the policy, payment, and sustainability issues related to e-consults. So let's start off with an icebreaker and a little bit of um, our audience participation here. You are seeing a 68-year-old woman with elevated liver function tests in your clinic. The patient has confirmed hepatic steatosis with elevated liver enzymes. You wonder, are there other tests that I should consider, and how often should she be monitored? So assuming that not all of you are hepatologists, and there are no wrong answers, how many of you would, in this case, search medical references like up-to-date or clinical guidelines to find the answer? Okay. How many of you would order a standard referral for the patient to be seen in the liver clinic? And how many of you would contact a specialist by phone or email or in-basket messaging? That would be me. Or other stalking methods. I'd probably be stalking John and getting that question. So this case is a good example of this primary specialty care interface that our program is targeting for improvement. And really the question is here, how does this provider get the information and the guidance he or she needs to appropriately manage this patient? So we know that we are facing a growing aging population and the prevalence of chronic disease is increasing in our population. That combined with advances in complex medical treatment is leading to the increased demand in specialty care. This is a graph from an article written by Timothy Dahl that shows the projected growth in office visits to physicians and selected medical specialties. He writes in his paper 
that if our pattern of use and our delivery of, a, of care remain unchanged, that the demand of specialty, specialty services will increase and the current supply of specialists will not be able to meet that demand. In addition, a more recent AAMC paper released earlier this year estimates a shortage of about 30,000 to 70,000 non-primary care physicians by 2030. So with the demand and increase in specialty care, it's not surprising that one out of three patients are referred to a specialist each year, and that specialty visits account for more than half of all outpatient visits. Despite the frequency of the referral and the, referral, uh, the importance of the referral process, uh, the process itself is a longstanding source of frustration for both primary care and specialty care providers. Um, oftentimes, communication and coordination is limited and indirect, um, resulting in fragmentation of care. And that fragmentation of care can lead to lower quality, higher cost, and patient dissatisfaction. Now, the referral process, we hear uh, frustration from both sides. From the referring providers, they comment that there's no guidance on pre-referral workup. There's also, there can be also a long lag time for referral review, and the review process is not always transparent. From the receiving specialist side, they comment that occasionally where the referral provider's question is not clear, and there's not enough information on the referral for them to provide a thoughtful response. They also comment that they're not clear what role they should be playing in the co-management of the patient. The curbside consult, which I'm guilty of uh, requesting from time to time, is problematic. Um, as many of you know, it's a brief conversation, so information is limited, and there's no documentation of the dialogue or plan within the electronic health record. And specialists can be inconvenienced and overburdened and are not compensated for this type of work. So the frustration with the referral process, the increased demand in specialty care, as well as um, the uh, fragmentation of care has really led many people to look at the process and identify ways to improve it. In 2014, the, Ameri the Association of the American Medical Colleges, otherwise known as the AAMC, received a CMMI award with the goal of implementing e-consults and enhanced referrals to improve the communication and coordination between PCPs and specialists. The AAMC has been working with multiple academic medical centers to help enhance, streamline, and improve the referral process, as well as introduce e-consults into the ambulatory care setting to help facilitate access as well as comprehensiveness of care. They have been disseminating a model uh, that was developed and piloted at UCSF. They have also created a collaborative made up of uh, multiple academic medical centers, otherwise known as Project Core. The University of Washington joined this collaborative back in 2016, and for us it's been a really wonderful forum for us to learn from other academic medical centers who face similar challenges, as well as share best practices and strategies for implementation. So these are the participating academic medical centers as part of this project core. There have been three waves of this uh, collaborative so far. Wave one was part of the CMMI ward, it includes San Diego, University of Wisconsin, Iowa, Virginia, and Dartmouth Hitchcock. We were part of wave two, and we were in good company with the University of Michigan, Ohio State, ECU, Vidant, and Wake Forest. What is currently ongoing is now wave three, and that is including uh, Utah, Colorado, the Medical College of Wisconsin, Metro Health, Greenville, Penn State, and Yale University. And we were actually on a call yesterday, and it looks like OHSU uh, in Oregon is also part of this uh, wave three as well. So there are about 17 academic medical centers across 15 states participating in this collaborative. Now the core model itself, there are two features to the model. The first feature is enhancement of the current referral process, where there is point of care decision support for the referring provider through a template that conveys pre-consultation guidance. The template also helps streamline the transmission of information where there is a prompt for the referring provider to enter their clinical question, it pulls in key diagnostic data, and there's also a prompt for the referring doctor to indicate what role they would like the specialist to play in the management of the patient. The second feature, and probably the more innovative feature of the model, are e-consults. E-consult is an asynchronous exchange initiated by a primary care provider to a specialist around a clinical question through a structured template in the EHR. In lieu of an office visit, 
the specialist provides recommendations back to the primary care provider, and that provi primary care provider continues to directly manage that patient. The expectation for a turnaround time is three business days. This is a diagram of the core model. You see the PCP here, uh, and this is the workflow. The PCP can decide to submit an enhanced referral so that the patient can be seen in person by a specialist. The PCP can also decide, if it's a straightforward question, to send an e-consult through the electronic health record to a designated specialist who then provides recommendations back to the PCP, and the PCP then manages the patient. The specialist does have the ability, if they see an e-consult that is too complex, that they, they can convert it to an in-person appointment. Now, there are multiple benefits to the key stakeholders with this model. First, for patients, they get rapid access to specialty care without an additional visit, which is much more convenient for the patient, and there are fewer out-of-pocket costs. For primary care providers, they get timely access to specialty input. They get education from the specialist on how to handle clinical conditions that they, that they may not feel comfortable dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And it, as a result, patients get to stay in their primary care medical home, and it's improved continuity of care for the patient. For the specialists, through the templates, there's a structured approach to consults and referrals. And also by keeping the straightforward patients in primary care, they're allowed to increase capacity for more complex patients in their clinic. For leadership, there's improved, it's a model that provides high quality care at a lower cost. And they're also able to address access issues in high demand areas. And for payers, um, an improved access to specialty care results in a, their members have an improved experience. And also there's potentially cost savings if e-consults could eliminate the need for a face-to-face -face visit. All right, let's spend a few minutes to talk about our experience so far at the University of Washington. So many of you know that UW Medicine is comprised of wholly owned and operated entities. We have four main hospitals and we have a community a network of community clinics that provide the bulk of our primary care. This is map shows the geographic distributions of our care facilities. You see here that we have a primary care clinic north at Arlington and also have some recently established clinics on Orcas and Lopez Island as well and a clinic as far south as Olympia. UW Medicine employs about 2,000 physicians, and about 500 to 600 of them are primary care providers. UW Medicine has over 2 million outpatient visits annually. Now, there were many reasons why UW Medicine decided to move forward with the core model. First of all, it was a model that would address specialty care access, particularly in high demand areas, and it was an opportunity to try to improve the efficiency of the referral process. Also in 2014, we had full ambulatory integration of our EHR on EPIC, which means both our primary and specialty care clinics were on the same electronic health record, with, gave, which gave us a technical ability to be able to communicate between primary and specialty care, which was essential um, part of the, of the model. There was also movement by UW Medicine towards value-based care. And by being able to implement a model that provide high quality at lower cost, allowed UW Medicine to be in a better position to provide value-based care. And there was a lot of focus on developing a robust telemedicine program, with e-consults being a very important tool for telehealth. So as we were getting uh, our project off the ground, it was important for us to engage the key stakeholders here at the University of Washington. First, we needed to make sure we engaged our UW Medicine leadership to make sure that we had the groundwork to move forward and wanted to make sure that the project and the program itself aligned with the priorities of the organization. We also needed to secure resources to make sure we had IT resources for the EHR build, as well as to ensure that we were able to support the clinicians in this work. We also engaged primary and specialty care providers and we met with multiple provider groups to talk about their concerns and frustrations with the current referral process. We talk about the core model and how the core model would help address some of their concerns. And as part of the program, we were able to advocate to provide a scaled work RVU credit per e-consult to specialists based on the time spent on an e-consult. 
Now we acknowledge and recognize that there is actually increased workload on the primary care provider with this model. And although we were unable to provide a similar credit for the primary care providers, we think that there is actually opportunity in the future to do this. John, later in the talk, will be talking about some new Medicare codes for e-consults that actually credits both the primary care provider or the ordering provider as well as a specialist. So in addition to engaging the key leadership, it was important for us to develop a process and a workflow such that a busy clinician could integrate this into their practice. So for those of you familiar with EPIC, and soon everybody will be familiar with EPIC, these are a few screenshots that show how you order an e-consult. Under the meds and orders section, you type in e-consults and it will pull up all the specialties where e-consult is available. Once you choose your specialty, it will pull up condition-specific templates and the provider would choose the one that most uh, uh, is most relevant to that patient's uh, medical condition. When you choose that template, it will then pull in the whole template into the order, and it contains pre-referral guidance, a prompt for the clinical question, automatically pulls in laboratory data, and then it, and here it's a, a prompt for the uh, ordering provider to indicate what to do if an in-consult gets converted to an in-person visit. Once the e-consult is ordered and signed, it goes into a specialty-specific e-consult pool, which is accessed by a specialist. This is the view from a specialist point of view. A designated specialist is signed into an e-consult pool. They can click on this into this folder, and they'll see all the e-consults uh, waiting for them to answer. When they click on this e-consult, they can read the question, the relevant data, and provide their recommendation. Because this is all built in within the same electronic health record, they also, with a couple of clicks, able to review the patient's medical record, look at historical data, lab data, and old uh, chart notes. We also ask the specialist with every e-consult encounter to indicate a code reflecting how much time they spent on responding to the e-consult. This allows us to capture their effort and credit their work RVU. So although we're not billing for e-consults right now, the process and the workflow that we've developed is in anticipation of billing because we're a very optimistic group. I knew that it would happen at some point, and it will. So this is our program overview so far. Our patient population that we've targeted are adult patients seen by a primary care provider at UW Medicine. There are a couple of specialties, dermatology and allergy, that actually accept pediatric e-consults. And these patients should be new to the specialty, not seen within the past two years. We went live with our initial wave, three specialties in wave one in July of 2016, that being endocrinology, hematology, and dermatology. So, and so far, we've, we are currently live with 14 specialties. 11 of those are in the Department of Medicine. Since we've launched the program, we've had really positive support for e-consoles, both on the specialty side and the primary care side. Over 280 unique primary care providers have submitted an e-consult, and we have onboarded over 90 e-consultant specialists across the 14 uh, specialties. We've had over 5,900 e-consults completed, and the specialty responses ha that have been submitted have been well within 72 hours, and I would say the majority of them are probably within 24 hours. So the responsiveness from the specialists has been pretty terrific. This is our timeline for our specialty launches. Again, we went live first in July of 2016 with dermatology, endocrinology, and hematology. We had a year break because there was a big epic upgrade and we were unable to make modifications to the EHR. We then went live with our second wave in December um, and, and November of 2017 with gastroenterology, pulmonary, and hepatology. Then wave three in January of 2018 cardiology, nephrology, neurology, and rheumatology. And then our final wave uh, was staggered a little bit between April and June of 2018 with allergy, infectious disease, urology, and psychiatry is our most recent uh, onboarded specialty. As we onboard a specialty, probably one of the most productive and impactful discussions happens during our in-person e-consult and referral template design session, where we have representation from primary care, specialty care, and IT. If you think about the template, that's really a starting point of a conversation between a primary care provider and a specialist around a clinical question related to a patient. So it's important that these templates be built collaboratively. 
During these in-person uh, design sessions, there is very active discussion about what the clinical content should be within those templates. And the group really works hard to achieve balance to ensure that the specialist has enough information that they need to provide a thoughtful response, but that it doesn't overburden the PCP. And we realize that that, that is an iterative process. As we've gained more experience with developing these templates, we have created guiding principles for the template development to provide guardrails around these conversations to help promote balance and also to help ensure that the templates have a consistent look and feel to them and similar formatting. So here's an example of the hypertension e-consult template from Nephrology. You can see here at the top, these are the pre-referral guidance that Nephrology is requesting. They're asking the PCP to indicate NSAID use, alcohol use, and adherence to medications, and also informing the PCP that a secondary hypertension workup is not necessary, but that they want them to be very specific with what they need assistance with. Here is a prompt for the clinical question. Any pertinent laboratory data is automatically pulled into this template. And here's a prompt here for the uh, primary care provider to um, tell the specialist how best to communicate to the patient if a patient needs to be seen actually in person. Here's another example of a hematuria e-consult template from urology. You see here the urologist provides their pre-referral guidance up at top. They're asking the um, PCP to rule out a UTI. And once you've ruled out a UTI, then they, re they recommend what imaging studies you should get. Again, similar formatting where there's a, a, a prompt for the clinical question it pulls in the, any pertinent laboratory data and then some instructions on how best to communicate with the patient if the patient needs to be seen in person. So as we, as we kind of meet for these in-person design sessions, we also talk with the specialties about what are common diagnoses you see in your practice and what conditions would be amenable for an e-consult. Um, and so with that information, then we build the templates based on those conditions. And the next three or four slides, we're gonna just review quickly kind of what the conditions uh, specific templates are for the different specialties. You see here for wave one, dermatology, endocrinology, and hematology, you can see very common conditions that they see in their practice. You can see here that endocrinology <coughs> has chosen to add an unspecified template. And this is a template where a PCP can ask a question if for some reason the patient's condition doesn't quite fit neatly into the uh, above diagnoses. These are a wave two uh, specialty e-consult templates for hepatology, GI, and pulmonary common conditions. And what you'll notice is that the numbers vary uh, from specialty to specialty. Some specialties have a lot of diagnoses, others may not have as many. These are the wave three e-consult specialty templates for rheumatology, cardiology, nephrology, and neurology. And all of these specialties have an unspecified template here for those miscellaneous questions. And then wave four specialties, allergy, infectious disease, urology, which is our first surgical specialty on e-consults, and psychiatry. And you can see the variability in the number of templates each specialty decided to move forward with. So in terms of our volumes, overall, we average about 500 e-consults per month across all the specialties. This graph is a pretty um, busy graph, but it shows the volumes per month by specialty. The take home here is really dermatology is probably our, is our busiest uh, uh, specialty here with e-consults. You can see after an initial ramp up period that consistently they've been over 100 e-consults per month. Um, and it peaked as high as 200 um, in August of this year. Our kind of our long-standing specialties, hematology and endocrinology. There's been slow growth in, um, the, in the number of e-consults, and they, on average, are, are averaging about 45 to about 60 or 70 e-consults per month. The newer specialties here, um, their volumes are lower, but we always, we generally see a ramp-up period when we onboard a specialty, and we expect these um, volumes to grow as PCPs get acclimated to the new specialties on e-consults. Where are the e-consult orders coming from? The majority of them are coming from the UW neighborhood clinics, which makes sense. They have the largest primary care base, followed by Harborview Medical Center. Northwest Hospital, their number, volumes are lower, but we recently onboarded Northwest Hospital primary care providers earlier this year. 
We have also expanded e-consults to include our uh, post-acute care service. So those providers who are seeing patients in the skilled nursing facilities have access to e-consults as well. And we expect that this volume will grow also. Valley Medical Center is not on this because Valley has a different instance of EPIC and so they are unable to communicate through the EHR with our EHR. In terms of program, other program data, a couple of metrics that we follow, in addition to the total number of e-consults that are ordered and completed, we also track two metrics, the conversion rate, which is what proportion of e-consults are converted to an in-person visit, and a decline rate, well, how, what proportion of e-consults are, are declined. And these metrics actually allow us to track the appropriateness of the e-consult being ordered, as well as the appropriateness of how they're being handled. You see our, our percentages here. When we look across at other academic medical centers, the average of the combined rate of these two is generally between 10 to 20 percent. So we're well with it uh, at range with our peers. You can see a jump up from quarter two FY18 from 6 percent to 11 percent, which is usually what happens when we onboard a new specialty because there's actually a learning curve on both sides, a learning from the primary care side as well as the specialty that we often see a jump up in conversion rate and we continue to track these measures. Another <clears throat> metric that we follow is also how much time it takes for a specialist to complete an e-consult. Here is an aggregate of all the specialties, and about 85% of the e-consults are completed within five to 20 minutes. Now that we see variability across specialties, for example, dermatology, there's a higher proportion of e-consults completed um, in five to 10 minutes, and other specialties like hematology, endocrine, pulmonary, um, generally take uh, longer and there's a higher proportion being completed uh, between 11 and 20 minutes. In addition to those metrics, we also follow access uh, data or access metrics. And one of the access metrics that we follow are the percentage of UW medicine patients seen within 30 days within that specialty. This is a graph and so the higher the percentage, the better the access. These are the um, access metrics for our three initial specialties in wave one, dermatology, benign hematology, and endocrine. And across all these three specialties, there was an average of a 30% improvement. And just to note that this metric is actually influenced by multiple factors and really is a reflection of all the access work that these specialties are doing, hiring new faculty and, that sort of, and changing their templates. So it's a combination of that effort. Mm -hmm. In addition to the quantitative feedback, we also elicit qualitative feedback. And here are some comments from the primary care providers as well as the specialists. For the primary care providers, the common themes that we hear are that they are extremely impressed with the timeliness of the responses, as well as the detailed recommendation and rationale uh, within the recommendation, within the e-consult. They also really appreciate the fact that e-consults empower them to take on more of the management of the patient um, and can do more before sending them to a specialty. And they want more and more and more e-consults. Um, from the specialist point of view, they feel the process works well. This comment also uh, highlights the fact that they appreciate that the patient's able to stay in their patient center, uh, their primary care medical home and re remove the need for the patient to make an additional visit. So if you look at our timeline, you'll see that we had a rapid implementation of three waves over a period of eight months and brought on 11 specialties. So right now in our program, we're taking a pause in terms of adding on new specialties, but we've been accumulating a list of specialties who have been approaching us to um, join the e-consult uh, bandwagon. Right now, our current operational focus are quality improvement and provider engagement. For quality improvement, we have a process of randomly taking a random sample of e-consults and doing a quality review. And two of my colleagues, Dr. Sen and Dr. Crystal, review these e-consults and they look at the appropriateness of the e-consult, the specificity of the PCP question, ensuring the diagnostic data that the specialist is requesting is done in advance, and also looking at the quality of the specialist's response. And if there are issues, both good and bad, they provide feedback uh, to those providers. The other area that we are focusing on is actually developing a consistent process for converted, a consistent scheduling process for converted e-consults. Many of the clinics and specialties have different way of appointing, and we want to make sure that our process is sound and that patients do not fall through the cracks and there's not a patient safety issue. 
The other area we're focusing on is ongoing provider engagement. And as I said in the beginning, one of the um, goals of this program is really developing a sense of community among primary and specialty care providers. And so we've been developing forums and tools to help support that. One of them are the round back meetings with existing specialties. So we go back to the specialties on e-consult. We meet with them, what's going well, what's not going well, how can we improve, are there modifications that we need to make to the templates, what messaging should we be providing to the PCPs? Um, the second is also co-management conferences, which is led by e-consultant specialists with a group of primary care providers. The goal of these co-management conferences are to review e-consults and the clinical content and really start a discussion about what should be our approach to um, managing common conditions. We also have an e-consult newsletter that comes out quarterly uh, to provide important information to our primary care providers. And we also have been discussion of establishing a group where we potentially could have research and academic products that can come out from this, uh, this program. This is a screenshot of one of our newsletters. You can see here that we provide sort of important updates about the program. We talk about what specialties are now live with e-consults. We provide tips, and we, we also provide information on do's and don'ts with an e-consult question. We also put in here an exemplary e-consult exchange, this one from infectious disease. And we also have our specialists uh, write something up, some clinical pearls or tips to put this in the newsletter. And here in this newsletter, we have David Garcia and Dr. Leslie Paternos from hepatology providing some guidance for hematology e-consults and how to evaluate mild thrombocytopenia. Okay, so I'm gonna loop back and go back to this patient case of this woman with elevated liver function tests in the clinic. Um, so fortunately, we did have e-consults available and this was an actual question that a PCP from one of the neighborhood clinics ordered. She had, was, had a very specific question, um, probably very, pretty straightforward for a specialist. And this was the response that she received from the hepatology specialist, Dr. Rex Cheng, um, which was really uh, terrific. He provides recommendations on what she, else she should consider, um, some recommendation on weight loss and, and when to check the LFTs, rationale uh, for his recommendation, and then a contingency plan on what to do if, uh, what are the parameters for when to consider referring the patient in person to hepatology clinic. And this is one of many outstanding um, e-consoles and I've read quite a few and the responses are really thorough and very thoughtful. And it was actually hard to choose one for this presentation, so, but. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Dr. Scott, who's gonna talk about policy and payer engagement. All right, well, one of the, one of the challenges um, when you're launching uh, new, new technology is uh, reimbursement. So sometimes you're, you're out uh, in front a little bit and e-consult's one of those uh, technologies where it, it's gonna make sense whether you're uh, primarily in fee-for-service or in value-based care. So our, our initial conversations several years ago, were, we were, our, most of our book of business was fee-for-service, and these are some of the things that we were, were talking up at the time. We, we know that in certain specialties, there's quite a bit of leakage, and this is a way to keep um, our primary care patients in our specialty um, uh, circle of influence. It also is uh, allowing us to see new, more new patients um, because some of these uh, are lower acuity patients and we're getting in higher acuity patients in a more timely fashion. We have data from our colleagues um, around the country that it leads to higher surgical yield, so especially for, uh, valuable for uh, urology. And uh, we know that the longer you wait to get in to see a doctor, the higher your no-show rate is. So this is going, going to help with our efficiency in getting our no-show rate down. And finally, and probably the most important thing, is it's improving the patient experience. They're getting um, an answer uh, uh, answered in a, in a timely fashion. If you're considering e-consults from a value-based care world, this is a, a great way to support care coordination and uh, supports the, the concept of the patient-centered medical home and comprehensive primary care and also is reducing unnecessary utilization. One of the most common comments I heard as we were shopping this around to specialists is, is the comment that about 10 to 20% of our patients probably don't need to be seen in clinic. And so we're trying to really uh, meet patients where, where they are 
and, and make it convenient for both the specialists and the patients. So this is the, uh, supports the concept that uh, patients are getting the right care at the right place and at the right time. And it will align with uh, the requirements of alternative payment models. So we, we talk a lot about the triple aim and um, we, we really feel like eConsults hits all those, those concepts. Um, we, we are in, in becoming more efficient. Uh, and one thing I wanna also highlight is that there's great teaching that occurs in these eConsults. So it's allowing our primary care providers to work at the maximum of their training. Uh, the, the patients are able to read their notes um, so they uh, know what the, the doctors are saying. And then when we've um, taken this idea to, to um, payers, we've, we've made a back of the envelope calculation that if you were to pay for these patients, um, you know, it's gonna be 250 to $300 for a level four, level five visit, plus the facility fee. Uh, whereas an e-console at the time we were using numbers from UCSF would be somewhere in the 50 to 170 range and no facility fee. So you're probably wondering, can I get paid for e-consults? And up to now, um, the answer was you were getting an RVU credit. And I really wanna um, highlight um, uh, Bill Bremner for making that possible. We, we have a policy from both regions, Molina, that they wanted to pay for it. So those are among our, our biggest payers. There is even a state law that supports this idea of what's called store and forward technology. And I think the real game changer occurred uh, last month when CMS said that they would start to pay for this. So let me dive into the details of that. As, as Lisa mentioned, this is an unusual payment arrangement where primary care providers will get a 0.7 RVU credit and the specialists will also get a 0.7 RVU credit. And it's this new CPT code that was created in 99451 and in 99452. So um, we, uh, on the, the draft policy, it was 0.5 for both those and the AMC Collaborative was able to provide data saying that it actually 0.7 was a more reasonable number and in this case CMS um, agreed with us. So there are a couple of conditions uh, to get paid. Um, you have to be able to bill Medicare uh, and the patient needs to consent to this. We wanna make sure that they're uh, in, in, informed about this process and if there's a copay, they, they need to know that, that they might be responsible for that. There's no restrictions on who can order this. So we have really wanted this to be something that PCPs ordered, but uh, CMS said a, a specialist in theory could order this to another specialist. And also there is a clause that if um, th these get converted within 14 days to the specialty, then there would not be a double charge, that there would only be the in-person charge and the e-consult charge would be, be dropped. So Regents, as I said, has had a policy for several years. Um, they have uh, several criteria. The first is that more than 50% of the time needs to be devoted to the medical consultation and this is a secure online discussion and they wanted to make sure that the patient was aware of this occurring. They were using the old CPT codes in 99446 through 9 with a GQ modifier. We'll probably see them adapt the um, Medicare CPT codes and similar to the CMS policy, there's a 14-day exclusion period. So in terms of uh, next steps, we are working with um, contracts and UWP to turn this on for 2019. I think the big thing is making sure that we have IT uh, capability to um, document consent by patients. And we are now looking at taking e-consult external, so outside of our, our EPIC and uh, instance. And so working with FQHCs and some of our strategic partners to uh, make this available to them. We also uh, know from other colleagues around the country that this has been a great research tool. Uh, it's also a great teaching tool. So for example, in dermatology, you have these, these images, you can sit down with your residents, your fellows, and go through them, and, and they can be a part of that, that teaching and educational process. And as uh, Lisa said, there will be ongoing uh, co-management conferences in, in QI to refine this process. So, in, and I just wanted to say a little bit about uh, the telemedicine uh, strategy. Uh, we are uh, laser focused in the next year on supporting FIT. And so the, as many of you know, the strategic initiatives uh, under FIT are the Women Children's, uh, Neurosciences Institute, Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, Transplant and Cardiology. So we, we do have activities uh, in all those areas that are either underway or in the planning stage. We also uh, will have a pilot 
in primary care, uh, working with Pete McGuff, uh, probably with the, on the island clinics, and then um, we will be supporting post-acute care with live video teleconferences for patients who were recently discharged from a UW medicine facility. We're working with our ACO and CIN colleagues, and uh, we also have some several other activities that align with our mission. We have Tale of Jail for mental health and for HIV, and hopefully with uh, radiology, and also have a, a Project ECHO focus on transgender care. So in summary, um, eConsult is a new way for UW Medicine to meet the access challenge, and uh, reimbursement is coming uh, in 2019, so we will be getting paid for this. And I really want to make the point, this is an example of how our EMR can help us to um, meet the demands without having to resort to our traditional ways of doing things. So in the old days, the way we handled access was building new clinics and hiring new doctors, but we didn't have to do that in this case. And I think this is especially important as we are transitioning to transformation of care and being all-in-one EMR. This is an a, a example of how the EMR can help us to be more efficient. And also is an example of how uh, collaboration with our academic colleagues around the country can be really valuable. It was uh, super uh, helpful to have that leverage with CMS to have 14 different academic medical centers showing their experience. And we are now working towards being more uh, system-wide in our thinking. Uh, we're a growing entity, as Lisa pointed out with our, the map, and we expect that that's just going to continue even more with our, our ACO and CIN um, partners. So just wanted to highlight um, some key members uh, on our team. Uh, Lisa had mentioned Sarah Jackson and Crystal Wong. Uh, my colleague, Carrie Preby, uh, has been instrumental. And really, I think we need to um, take our hats off to Leah Rosengauss, the project manager, was, was uh, super helpful in this process. There are a couple other people I wanted to say thanks to, um, as I mentioned before, Bill Bremner, uh, who provided our review credits. The CMO's office, so Carlos Pellegrini and David Flum, uh, provided salary support for several of the people on the team uh, and were um, very helpful with giving advice on, on strategy on this. And finally, I want to thank all of you. Um, so many of you um, took a leap of faith with us to either be um, signing up as a specialist to do this or to be PCP um, who was ordering this. I just want to see a show of hands. How many of you have either ordered an e-consult or have uh, provided an e-consult? So it looks like about 50% of you. So um, thank you um, all for, for being willing partners in this uh, enterprise. And I think with that, we'll, um, we'll take some questions. Thank you.